Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Placemakers, our first EV speaker series by CMLC. Tonight's discussion is about how our team is integrating and using public art to create a new community and a new identity for East Village. To get us started, I'd like to introduce Susan Veers, Vice President of Marketing Communications with CMLC, to say a few words. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to be, I'll, I'll, you know, in, I'll declare right now, this will be the most boring presentation you see tonight. <laughs> um, we have wonderful presentations by our artist group, and um, so really my role here tonight, um, to, beyond welcoming you all, is as the staff designate to explain to you a little bit about our work at CMLC in East Village, and also to explain to you this notion of, of placemakers. So I guess if someone to ask me what, you know, what is placemakers, um, in, in truth, it's shameless self-promotion for a team of 16 people that's developing East Village, but we're quite proud and we wanted to brag a little bit because in 90 days, uh, less than 90 days, residents begin to move into East Village and that's, it's really, thank you, yeah, <laughs> thanks Drew, thanks Drew, it's really, it's really significant. Um, but, um, but really what Placemakers is, is it, it's a public discussion. So four times in the next 12-month uh, calendar period, you're going to see the CMLC come to you, um, and we're going to show you the faces of CMLC, and we're going to describe to you the rejuvenation efforts that are unfolding in East Village, and we're going to explain to you our methodologies for garnering community support, um, our ambitions to give back to the city of Calgary, and really our excitement about populating a community in the downtown core with 11,500 residents. So you're going to see us and you're going to learn more about us, the team at CMLC, in the next year. But um, tonight we're going to talk about our approach to um, art in East Village and how we have our curating an art program for the village that is really changing the reputation of the community and attracting interest. So I, I really can't talk about art before I talk about infrastructure, and specifically I want to talk about the 49 acres of master plan, which is uh, an urban village called East Village. And so when our team and our consultants imagined East Village, we, we studied the urban context, and one of the things that were re was really missing from, from East Village was this notion of connectivity. And, and so we needed to connect that village again to the downtown core, but also to the surrounding neighborhoods on both sides of, of the, the Bow River. Um, decades of infrastructure decay had, had left the community quite isolated, and in actual fact, it had a lot of dis social disorders. So we began this infrastructure program, and, and we began to raise the floodplain, we, we built roads, we built sidewalks. We uh, put avenues in place, we put streetlights in place. You're going to hear about streetlights tonight from Michelle. But um, it, it isn't an easy task delivering that type of infrastructure. Just ask any one of our, uh, the members of our construction and development team or who are among you tonight. It's, 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 uh, it's quite an intricate uh, affair. But as we were delivering those really complex, multi-year infrastructure programs, we were asking ourselves, how can art and art experiences be woven into this infrastructure program to really change an experience um, and create a really meaningful interaction in a great public space. So uh, we often refer to, in our, in our um, office, we often refer to the, that infrastructure as hardware. And the hardware is super important because it connects the community. I mean, now you can see we are connected across the river by the Elbow River Traverse and by St. Patrick's Island Bridge. We're also going to be connected to the west through the, through the new central library. And then we're going to be connected to the south, as you know, through 4th Street Underpass. So that's hardware. It's really, it's required, it's important, but it isn't what makes a community. It's the software that makes a community, and we refer to that software as programs, as public art, and as public spaces. Tonight you're going to hear for, from four wonderful, really wonderful artists, uh, Ron Moppet, Daniel Kirk, Patrick Marold, who, by the way, uh, is really part of the National Music Center team, but we've... We've coerced him to come here today to talk to you about the, the National Music Center. And then, of course, Michelle Dubois <laughs> to talk about uh, art installation on St. Patrick's Island. 
So the manner in which we select and fund public art for East Village is not the same process that the city might use for uh, public art. We use a, a different approach. Um, the only exception to the presentations tonight will be Patrick's, which is, uh, it follows very true to, to the policy, the city's policy for public art. Um, we used a different approach. We were in a deficit position in East Village. We were literally building from the ground up, trying to mastermind a community and using art and culture to, to change our reputation and our image. So our, our efforts are quite different. Um, when we started this project as a team, I don't think uh, one of us really imagined just how significant it would be, but, but it is significant. We are welcoming 800 to 900 people this year, and then there will be a succession of move-ins over the next couple of years as East Village populates itself. So um, we're quite proud of what's unfolding in East Village. Um, I wanted just to acknowledge our staff, they're all here today, and Michael Brown is with us as well. Um, certainly we're here to answer any of your questions, but really enjoy the presentations. This was the most boring one. And what they have to say about what they're building in East Village and helping us achieve in East Village is quite remarkable. I hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks. Excuse me just for one minute. Okay, thank you, Susan. Let's get things started. Our first presenter tonight is Patrick Marold, who, who you heard Susan just speak about. Patrick is the artist who's delivering a permanent art installation as part of the new National Music Center, which be, is being built in East Village. And while his commission isn't directly uh, associated with CMLC's infrastructure programs, we felt it very important to include his work in this discussion, as it's an amazing example of how a building's design, function, and user experience can be enhanced through a permanent public art installation. Patrick is a native of Colorado. He has been working as an artist and primarily a sculptor since earning his Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1997. He has pursued his practice in various locations in America and abroad. He has also been the recipient of various grants and awards, including the Fulbright Fellowship in Iceland. His installation titled The Windmill Project in Colorado was recognized as the best of public art in 2007 by the Americas for the Arts, an accomplishment that he repeated in 2012 again with his sound and light performance in Denver. Much of his work explores our relationship with the land through habitation, industry, and community. He often works site specifically while also creating in-studio works. Patrick was selected by the National Music Center and their volunteer jury committee following an extensive RFP process in 2014 to select an artist for public art within the new building. His visionary concept addresses the relationship between art and the iconic building, the values of the National Music Center's visitor experiences, and the challenges of the site. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Merold. Can you guys hear? All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always enjoyable to talk about my work. Um, and public art for me is an opportunity to uh, engage, well, the public uh, in an experience. Um, I was really attracted to the uh, National Music Center because of the context, uh, just what the uh, center represents as far as. Um, well, music, music and sound. Plus the building is just an incredible physical context to uh, be allowed to work in. Um, what I'm gonna be delivering, what I'm creating is called the Solar Drone. Excuse me. Solar Drones Project, which basically is going to translate the character of the sky and the sun into a sound experience with 16 resonant vessels that are fabricated, constructed from uh, part of the collection. When the flood happened, there were some uh, flood damaged pianos from that collection. I've taken uh, 12 of the sound boards um, that I'm currently working on. These are digital renderings, obviously. But they'll be 
the basis for those resonant boxes, those vessels that will uh, then use this electromagnetic system that takes solar panels from the roof to inform and power the, uh, the system itself. A very simple schematic, but it gives you an idea. You have the solar panels on the rooftop and just one little line going. No. Um, <laughs> no, it's very basic, but uh, this is going to be located in the sky bridge uh, that links the two buildings. And the point is to somehow reveal these variations, the dynamic of the sky, which Calgary, similar to where I come from, has a lot of sun. Um, you also have clouds, but all these variations are going to change what you hear, as well as just the time of day. You know, at sunrise or sunset, you may s hear one or two of these actually activating, whereas at um, midday, all 16 will be activated. Simple plan view layout. These shapes have been derived uh, the, from the actual sound boards, what, what, I was, what was delivered to my studio and what I started uh, cutting up and working with. Oh, let's see, sorry. Uh, very basic schematic, again, uh, about how this works. You have the solar panel that um, is basically powering an electromagnetic system similar to uh, sometimes they're called EBOs for the musicians out there. But it, it activates the steel music wire, um, causing it to vibrate and oscillate and create a tone. These shapes, uh, you'll see here in a second how this is an example of one of the sound boards and the usable material that I'm able to pull from these. And, um, you know, to work with these sound boards that are, you know, from the 1800s, it's incredible to start looking at the stamps on these and um, handling them. Uh, the rest of the box will be of Sitka spruce. These are some species of spruce, probably European spruce, uh, with most of these. Um, Here's another example. I'll be able to get three out of this. They'll be smaller vessels, but um, the proportions, the dimensions of all these boxes will determine the, the tone and the note and the sound, um, how they'll be tuned. Um, it's an example of uh, what the solar array on top of the roof will look like. And uh, let's see. All right, there we go. There's, Anyway, that's a solar study of how these shadows will um, sometimes hit them all, sometimes just a few. And the system itself, uh, we're engineering uh, it to be as, as sensitive as possible to, uh, um, so that you'll hear these variations um, and they'll create uh, different sounds, different tones, different notes, and really just these sustained drones throughout the day. You may walk through the hallway and just spend the time it takes from walking from one end to the other, and you'll hear just that five second experience, or some people may hang out and listen to it, almost meditate on the sound. The space itself is such an incredible building anyway, I can't imagine that you're not going to want to stop and admire the architecture, admire the view, and uh, really kind of take in that sound and um, what's going on. But yeah, so I think that's the last slide in my, uh, Presentation, but that's what I'm doing for uh, the National Music Center. Thank you, Patrick. So, next up is the creative genius of Ron Moffat. Ron is a painter living and working here in Calgary. He attended the Alberta College of Art and Design and the Instituto de Allende, which I'm sure I've pronounced perfectly, in Mexico in 1968. Ron is one of Canada's leading contemporary artists. His career includes a significant number of honors, exhibitions, publications, and awards, including numerous Canada Council grants and the prestigious Gershon Iskowitz Prize in 1997. He has worked as a curator and a teacher and has exhibited extensively throughout Canada, the United States, and Europe. Ron's work can be found in many private, prominent public and, uh, excuse me, private and public locations, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, the Art Gallery of Alberta, the Glenbow Museum, and the Mackenzie Art Gallery, just to name a few. 
In 2013, Ron curated Made in Calgary, the 1970s, an important survey exhibition of Calgary's artistic community during that decade. And in the fall of this year, Ron's sculptural and installation work will be the subject of a survey curated by Christine Sowiak at the, Na at the Nickel Arts Museum. In 2010, Ron responded to the first RFP that CMLC issued for public art installations in East Village. Ron's breadth of, breadth of experience and inspired concept was the perfect complement for the emerging East Village. His 110-foot mosaic installation entitled The Same Way Better Reader was unveiled on a snowy day in October 2012 along with East Village's first, um, along East Village's first pedestrian-only street called Riverfront Lane. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ron Moffat. Thank you for coming. Um, let's do something else. Okay, so this is what the mosaic looks like. And I would imagine that many of you have seen it and it, it runs for 100 plus feet. And um, it's called The Same Way Better Reader. And the reader part is a dedication to for William Reader, who was our city park superintendent for many years. And actually when this project was underway, it was the 100th anniversary of our city parks program here in Calgary, which I think uh, is really quite stupendous. Uh, my wife is a master gardener, so I am um, told that one of the things that William did for the gardens that he uh, challenged and nurtured was to grow palm trees here in Calgary. And in that center panel up here, so I'm sure there are many people who say, you know, what the hell have we got palm trees in a <laughs> mural about Calgary for? Well, it was because William Reeder took it upon himself to challenge his local circumstances and See big. That panel also references the fact that Calgary is a much more cosmopolitan place than it, it was when I came here. I came to Calgary when I was 12 from England. It was a totally romantic adventure for me because I left most of my stuff behind. I was 12 and I was coming to the land of cowboys and Indians and bears and mountains and all of that stuff. And I knew the East Village uh, when it was sort of low on its heels. And I remember amazing secondhand stores. And as an art student, that was fabulous. But I also remember the stench of the tannery and various other establishments, which were not so good. Anyway, gradually as Calgary uh, expanded, um, it became more and more of a forgotten part of the town. Uh, downtown became a business center, and then everybody moved out to the suburbs, and uh, it was like that for many, many years. And then when the new city hall went up, of course, this was behind it, and it was really forgotten then. So this is sort of what things looked like down there uh, when I was approached to come up with a design, and it's pretty gray, and it's pretty, pretty not so good. <laughs> uh, my first uh, design was basically cut out paper, a model, very traditional. It was originally supposed to be on one side of the flyover from the north side of the city. Uh, that proved unworkable and then moved into a freestanding structure which made it way better. And I have to say that Every step along the way for me with this project was totally excellent. I learned a ton making this. It wasn't that we went to Munich and got some folks over there to break some tiles and copy my design. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, so it took about a year to come up with uh, a design, uh, to figure out the engineering for the preparation 
This is, um, I put this in this here because this is what one of my paintings normally looks like. And, and I want to emphasize the fact that um, the mural is an artwork. It is what my work normally looks like because there are different approaches to public art. There are people who do projects um, and there are people who, like me, get lucky enough to make something bigger than they normally could. So here we are in Munich. And the thing about Munich that was totally amazing is that here you had you know, a stump and a hammer where somebody is breaking glass tile, and most of it is Venetian tile, some Mexican tile, and working on these big tables. But on the other hand, so they've been doing this for hundreds of years, on the other hand, they have the most up-to-date technologies to go along with that craft. And so on the table are paper printouts of my designs from the digital files at real size. A, a scrim mesh is laid over it that is semi-transparent. And then they break the tiles and glue them onto the mesh. And just like the people who do the tiling in your bathroom, um, those mesh patches, so to speak, are glued to your, to your wall, in this case, glued to that wall. When we first went there, uh, they wanted to know how I talked, because what they didn't want to have happen was for me to visit, to talk, to have them going, and then a couple of months later for me to tell them that they got it wrong because, of course, I couldn't be there all the time. But we were on the same page immediately, so it was brilliant that way. So this is um, one of the panels, or a paper version of one of the panels, and the first thing to do was to develop a palette of tile colors for those uh, areas. And here we have a couple of the uh, craftsmen working on in this case, the, the black and white panel that's at the, the center of the mural, which is actually based on a, a small section of fabric. And one of the things that we solved at that point was there's a young boy with, a, with an animal in that panel, and it's clearly a European kind of reference to beginning settlement of this area. Uh, but they were wanting to make the face of the little boy round, and I had to make it clear that um, we weren't doing that. We were going flat because we're talking about fabric here. When everything was done in Munich, and that took about, so a year in the preparation of the design and the files and the engineering and all of that kind of thing, and a year of making it on those tables in Munich. It's shipped to Calgary in boxes. So they've cut, they've prepared the mural on the table, they've cut it into sections that are not exactly rectilinear, but approximately so. And each of these patches is numbered and put in a box. This is Franco who's starting to install the mural. Now Franco is wearing more clothing than he ended up with. And I say this because one of the funny things that happened to me when I was in Munich was they always wanted to know what the weather would be like. <laughs> and if you've lived in Calgary long enough, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I happened to think that September was going to be fine. But you know how it is, because I think most people in many parts of the world think that we come out of our igloos for a couple of months in the summer and you know, do the best we can. But September proved to be terrific. So they turned up with lots of clothing, and by the end of the month, they were in a t-shirt and shorts, and it was all good. So you see the boxes over there, and that's where the, the patches of the tile are. So here's what one would look like. And you see that scrim that the uh, tiles are glued to. Now, notice how the, and I, I was talking about how uh, I learned as much doing this as, as, as anything. And 
the, the way the tile is laid is just, if you're there and looking at the mural, you will see that the tiles are all, some of them are going absolutely horizontal, some of them are going vertically, some are big and small, some are scattered, some are regimented. It's, it's, you know, that was the kind of thing that I learned by being with these people who knew what they were doing. Now this shape here is part of a, 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 a symbolic hat shape. It, it's a con sort of a confluence of a top hat, a baseball hat, and a cowboy hat. And I do things like that. So the mural, while it references the history of Calgary, uh, in uh, a colorful way. It's not didactic in that way. But you can dip into it and extract various kinds of things that you can attach to some experience of Calgary, however you wish. So the, the site was tented off for weather reasons and uh, security reasons and for promotional reasons. And one thing that I think is important to say and important insofar as my experience with the CMLC people and the East Village is concerned is what's truly unique about this is that us artists get to go in first, right? So whether it's Julian Opie with his rectilinear digital box that you've probably seen, um, there's no, there were no buildings there. Right there were the beginnings of holes and it was gray and most unusual because usually and practically always what an artist traditionally gets is a place to put something, almost like icing or the final decoration on a cake. So it's really amazing to have the prospect of developing something right at the beginning. So there's that center what I call the fabric panel there. And what's amazing when you go there, I think it's amazing, and other people have told me so, so I'm happy with that, that while it started off with a small little section of a piece of fabric, which is really black and white, the amount of color that's inside of that panel is really quite astounding. Astounding to me, because it was something that I learned, because Frankel was always at pains to say that you might see that shape as reading as a black shape or a red shape from, from yards away, but when you get up close, you still want to be engaged with it. You still want to have something different and, and fresh to look at, and it really does work that way. There are a number of these uh, vertical panels that the five, I guess, that run down the mural. And they were from a photograph that I took from the original Other Side site. And I have always, and only one of their craftsmen work on those panels. And they're the panels that have some granite at the center. But I always thought of those vertical black and white panels as what happens to you, you when you're traveling and it's in a car or a train or whatever and something goes by your window that way. There are markers that way. And what turned out to be, there's the color in the black and white. So it starts at the uh, south end. I think of this diamond moon at the, at the end as, be, as different from the beginning, from the other end, as that end being more of a beginning and this end being more uh, a spectacular kind of diamond moon future. So back to what it looked like when we started, which is pretty gray and pretty dungy. But So the team from Munich, uh, two of them, uh, spent a month putting it up. And one of the things that, um, am I gone too long? I'm good? OK. Um, that made it really uh, nice for me was that as we got going along, P 
people from some of the building sites would start turning up and they would have a partner with them or a relative or whatever and they really wanted to show them what they knew what was going on and that, I thought right this is good this <laughs> but the team from Munich they go home we're waiting a month before we're going to have this big deal opening and an unveiling and everybody's going to be there and I'm going to try and make something up about what it is and uh, then the weather happens right and it snowed that night. And I wake up in the morning and I think, really? Like, does this really have to be like this? But you know what? It was really, really good because the city was gray for, or, or monochrome for a different reason, for the weather rather than the industrial site that it had been previously. So what happened was the color just went bam, which is always what I wanted anyway. Right? I wanted a big freeze of color to enliven the circumstance. So it ended up being a, a good and a happy day anyway. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Uh, just a reminder, we'll, we, we will have all the artists back up on the stage for a panel following the presentations uh, to answer some of your questions and discussions about the art. So next up is Daniel Kirk. Daniel is a visual, visual artist from Calgary. He has been practicing since graduating from the University of Calgary's Bachelor of Fine Arts program in 2007. Evidence of Daniel's public commissions and private work can now be found throughout Canada and the United States, as well as Central America and Turkey. His work has contributed to the identity of Calgary through notable installations including Millennium Park, the Arts Commons, his cavernous Isolata project where he lived and worked in a box on Stephen Avenue for five days. And he is now the director and founder of Blank Page Studios, a local creative hub designed to encourage and engage dialogue and active participation in the development of Calgary's cultural sphere. In 2007, Daniel, along with his team, Ivan Ostapenko and Kai kubonik betcher responded to an RFP that CMLC issued to complete a second temporary curated installation along Riverwalk. The Field Manual, a compendium of local influences, now graces Riverwalk and was our second installation to transform the concrete bridge abutments, washrooms and maintenance facilities, which are challenging structures along the Bow River, into works of public art that engage audiences daily on their commute along Riverwalk. Please welcome Daniel Kirk. Is that on now? Mike? Yeah? Good? Ish? Can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Claire, and to everyone. So I'm here on behalf of a team of three, and uh, one of three. So Ivan Ostapenko and Kai Kabanok butcher um, were a huge part of this. And right from the, the kind of ground up, um, we'd created something that we hoped was really local to the East Village. So we didn't really know what that was and that was sort of we started with just a basic premise and understanding from our own uh, kind of history in, in Calgary so I'm from Calgary and my original interpretations of the East Village were very challenged through this process uh, and and that I think yielded a really complex work I hope uh, people have kind of been down to see it as well so um, basically the confluence of uh, Calgary's Two Rivers was sort of where we started. And um, the elbow and the bow and the sort of east end of Calgary's downtown. And, uh, and, and from there we kind of grew into these sort of, um, these, I guess, major influences. The whole project revolved around these sort of three major influences on the East Village. And one was uh, nature, one was infrastructure, and one was culture. And through history, I guess, of the East Village, um, we sort of wanted to start as far back as we could go. And it, it is hard to kind of find a, like a pre-colonial history of the land here. Um, we engaged with uh, people from the East Village community, so the Golden Age Club, the Drop-In Center, um, 
to kind of get a more contemporary history of that area. Uh, further back than that, we, um, we evoked a, a contact at the Native Center at the University of Calgary. Uh, Casey Eagle Speaker gave us some insight into kind of that pre-colonial contact uh, history. And I'll just kind of keep going a little bit through the slides. I've got 30 of them, I think, so keep me on. Yeah. <laughs> um, he really spoke about uh, Treaty 7 land and the fact that Calgary originally would be known in Blackfoot as Mohensis, which is this area that we are currently in. And very few of us know. I mean, being from Calgary, I had no idea. And um, this is kind of some of the rough sketches where we started. We, we originally wanted to go just one big sculpture, and that was sort of what we were pushing for. So you can see this sort of one of Ivan's sketches here of... Uh, of that sort of point of release, that real present moment, the airplane kind of taking flight from the hand. Um, and that was where we started thinking about the hand as a stand-in for figures and for people. And, and that the hands kind of resonate through the work now as these, as these, um, these stands-ins. So here you can kind of see some of that pre-colonial history as well as then a sort of original uh, town planning from, I think that doesn't have the date on it, but <laughs> Ivan will know that. I'm sure he's somewhere. Um, anyway, this sort of uh, the Blackfoot people, the original uh, Sutina nation, and uh, influences sort of in that area. As, as well as the same time, I don't know more was kind of going on in Calgary as well as throughout Canada, and, and that brought in a, a different type of dialogue to that work. Um, the East Village being very much a contentious place for displacement, for um, replacement, replenishment, for, it's a floodplain. It's, it's constantly brought people there to winter and then people have moved on. Um, and it's even up until really the CMLC's kind of job here now is to create more of a permanent place and more of a permanent home for people. Um, as you can see, when City Hall was built, it definitely cut the kind of downtown in half. You can see obviously opening up into Olympic Plaza, uh, quite nice, and then on the back side, basically just glorified parking. Um, and that was a big, <laughs> glorified, yeah, uh, a big kind of point of break, I think, for, for our contemporary history with that space. Um, so this is kind of where we started our jam session for where ideas were, were going to come from. And uh, this is my little cousin Ben's hands holding up a cat's cradle, uh, which you can now see kind of made it into one of the abutment pieces if you've been down to that area. Um, this was sort of the basis for some of the sculptural components. What we really wanted to do is, is engage a, a 3D component. It was mostly a two-dimensional kind of RFP that went out for 16 different surfaces, um, but we wanted to explore sculptural components within that, and I think that was kind of what set us apart. So here's another example. Uh, this is one of our pieces from the result of that process as well. Um, so polystyrene was kind of the material of choice, lightweight, easy to use. Uh, just go back. This shows some of the technical drawings that we had to sort of submit through the process in order to get approval for virtually just three bolts. Um, by the end of it, it was about four or five weeks, I think, uh, to kind of go back and forth with the city's bridge engineer and uh, guarantee that they weren't going to fall off and, well, hurt someone, I guess. Uh, this is another one of the freestanding sculptural components sort of in its very fundamental stage. Uh, stacked up polystyrene and then hand carved by Ivan Ostapenko. Um, we used kind of an analog digital sort of technique because this was kind of our first time experimenting with sculptural elements on this scale. Um, you'd stack up the foam, you'd project at the right distance with the digital projector these 3D renderings kind of in different points around and then that expediated the carving process. Uh, so. It wasn't quite the same as Michelangelo, but I give Ivan a lot of credit for being able to uh, really realize these forms in a very, very quick kind of timeline. Um, that little guy here on the left is, uh, or yeah, the left makes sense, um, is one of our wax sculptures that was cast from, from my hands, and that's the coyote. So we had the rabbit, the coyote, 
as native species to this area as some major kind of natural influences, as well as, again, made up from the figures, hands. And those are kind of evoking that, that role that we have as people who inhabit this space to kind of just witness and observe and then responsibly kind of act uh, accordingly to how we're interacting with these, uh, these different influences. Um, some sketches kind of from the preliminary process, working with Claire and the rest of the CMLC's team was incredibly good for us as emerging artists at the time to kind of, you know, create dialogue around ideas. How do, how do people interpret these sorts of scenes? Um, very professional. It was, it was a wonderful experience for us. Um, from there, we kind of got a little bit more refined and started to kind of really flush out what that looks like as we're in, uh, engaging with this sort of infrastructural element. This was a projected idea of sort of uh, the new library space that at that point didn't have a plan or anything sort of in place other than we knew it was going to go basically where our studio space was, where we were working at that time, uh, in the Eagle building, or perhaps some of you know it as a songwriter studio, which is now the big hole that is soon to be the library. Um, so Ivan took it upon himself with with Kai and myself as support to kind of uh, just imagine what a library space could look like. And that became sort of one of the abutments. On the other one here is more of the kind of natural uh, influence. And we had heard from Casey Eagle Speaker that uh, originally trees didn't grow very tall here, that it wasn't until they were introduced did they kind of reach above um, a certain, certain kind of height. And that was because the buffalo were so plentiful that they would pack the ground so so, you know, just completely. Millions of these creatures would just come through this valley and, and trees wouldn't take root. So this is kind of this look at being uprooted or planted. It's sort of that state of flux and uh, our idea of home. So we kind of evolved the ideas. Again, this analog digital kind of back and forth thing. Um, I'm a painter traditionally and kind of trained as that at the UFC and, and I wanted to branch out a lot sort of from there, but still this is kind of the roots for where I generate ideas. Um, so all three of us kind of continue these, what we called our, our jam walls or, or um, our collaborative sort of painting walls. And these are almost life-size to what the abutments sort of are. Uh, three kind of big rolls of canvas. Um, Part of that then was photographing painted work, photographing drawing work, uh, using print, using pattern, and integrating it into these sort of finished works. So these are the uh, one of the uh, washroom spaces. We had th two public bathrooms and one storage space to kind of cover all of the walls in. This was what we were calling then the nature box. Um, you can kind of see the way, again, like certain topographical lines interact with certain forest lines. Um, Katie Green, another artist in Calgary, uh, helped us out with this hand drawing, sort of integrating like the sweet grass and the braids of, uh, of wild grasses that sort of grow feathers, different sorts of elements. Uh, again, that uprooting, kind of planting reference, uh, the bear, the elk. And then you start to kind of have this crossover piece up above, which is that kind of reference to a cow, um, which Kai was really insistent on sort of integrating like the agriculture part of our interaction with nature. Uh, he's uh, more of a permaculture kind of guerrilla garden kind of guy, and he was great in, in terms of generating ideas. You can kind of see a little bit, and it's maybe easier when you go down to actually see it. There's bees, there's uh, tomatoes with like hypodermic needles, injecting them, there's shopping carts, there's, there's just sort of, uh, you know, bows and arrows and these different icons or symbols for sort of how we have interacted with nature and how we continue to interact with nature and what we kind of call nature <laughs> um, as if it's separate from ourselves. So that cow then kind of crosses over. You can see the head of the cow on this guy here. Uh, because that real kind of cross-section between nature and culture, this is the culture box, is that kind of agriculture sort of zone in this area. Again, a major influence in the East Village. Um, kind of displacing Buffalo with ranching and, and, and then obviously the stampede grounds close by. 
Um, so this being the culture box had to have a lot of layers, tons of different things going on in it. The culture in Calgary is very diverse. The culture in the East Village especially layered with all kinds of different things. So um, I'll let you kind of, you know, go down and see for yourself without decoding too much or, uh, you know, giving my interpretation of a lot of this, but music was a huge part with the St. Louis uh, and the King Edward and now the National Music Center, obviously. Um, there's some, you know, you know, trucks carrying ATVs with snowmobiles on the back because that sort of speaks a little bit to Calgary's culture of recreation and consumption. Um, but then there's also, you know, uh, the hot air balloons and the, you know, things that maybe were in my lifetime that were a big part of the culture that don't seem to be here as much anymore. Um, you know, certain politicians throwing maybe some change uh, <laughs> in the East Village. That was probably a thing as well uh, that some would recognize. But some stories from people in the East Village, those were high points for their, their time in the East Village were, were you know, like at a pub in the St. Louis, getting to know the mayor at the same time as living in a place for $300 a month. Um, those sorts of spaces created a very interesting dynamic in the East Village and traditionally, I think, created a great place for like politics to evolve and, um, and conversations to begin that sort of didn't rely so much on like socioeconomics. And uh, so we got some great stories. We did a tour of the East Village when we were originally engaging people uh, with a guy named Dusty, who was a resident at the DI, and he, he told us so many good stories. So we hopefully did some of them justice uh, in the integration into this work. So that's kind of what it looks like here now installed. And these are vinyl wrapped um, digital prints. Um, the hands in the work too, you can just kind of see if I'll just go back for a second. Um, obviously in all of them here, uh, on the culture box, we felt like language was a part of that that was important to engage as well. And so the, um, the sign for look is actually in there, but the, uh, the L trans kind of translates itself into a gun, and the, the K is actually very similar to a peace sign. So we sort of also wanted to engage that sort of notion. Within a culture, there's always going to be this tension between like war and peace and this sort of you know, inner dialogue with that. The O's are a little harder to see, but up here in the hands, so yeah. Um, and that just says look, which is kind of what culture also is all about and what placemaking I think ultimately has to deal with. So this is the infrastructure box and I won't ramble too much about the detail because I know we got a bunch of other surfaces to go to, but the major infrastructural components that we looked at here were again the St. Louis, the King Eddy, um, and the kind of pre-East uh, Village as an architectural site before uh, City Hall went in and what was kind of there originally. So um, some material, some, some different subsistence strategies in there, but mostly like the TP juxtaposed to like oil derricks to um, different materials that actually comprise things, rooftop gardens, the projection of what like uh, infrastructure could look like. Then these are maybe what people are more familiar with are the bridge abutments themselves. And you can see then where the cat's cradle piece kind of that we started ended up going. And this is sort of like the, I would say maybe the central piece for the whole work because it's the most evident when you're driving into this village on, is it, it's fourth, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well lit, beautiful kind of integration of like a, a little natural kind of landscaped area with the infrastructure itself. So it was a great scene to kind of have something that would be deemed like cultural and still maintain true to kind of all three of our influences in that area. Um, this is again, this is like reproductions of our paintings in the studio mixed with drawings, um, photographs, and painted directly then on site as well as we installed kind of like an exterior um, wallpaper that we'd sort of pioneered in a way, I guess. It was just basic print paper that we got in huge sheets uh, with our design scaled up that we applied with an acrylic exterior kind of paste that we had made, so like a glorified wheat paste, um, and then integrated the three-dimensional elements into the painting itself. So 
we'd always kind of hope to get some pigeons up along the, uh, the cat's cradle wires because they make a home up above the abutment there. Um, this is a, on the other side of that main bridge abutment, and this is sort of a, a look at that major influence of the CP rail in the East Village. Um, there is really like a tremendous amount of research that went into a lot of this, so without getting into all of the nitty gritty, we just really wanted people to maybe have a playful interpretation of what this space and uh, this kind of place was uh, and is and could be. Um, the RCMP, the, some of the infrastructural components that kind of came with the CP rail, engaging with the sort of pre-contact uh, culture, um, and what the infrastructure was there was much more fluid, and you know you have the ability for, uh, for you know to move with the herds versus then bringing in all the things that kind of you know were more sedentary. Um, whiskey traders, the introduction of uh, like that kind of brothel western sort of environment, kind of right away. Um, the original kind of people who were here building the railroads themselves, obviously being the migrant workers from China. Um, and a lot of stories then relate to these village directly from Chinatown as well in Calgary that I recommend you do a little research if you're curious about. Um, the projection then of what our library could look like um, on one side of the abutment. So it really does become kind of a heart uh, to a community. You can see right in the middle here this sort of main like aortic kind of um, vestibule sort of area, the C train kind of coming out underneath. Underneath that then is actually where our studio was, um, the St. Louis, just kind of right here next to it. Um, King Eddie, you'll have the future music center there. It, 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 it's a nice, again, a nice placemaking sort of thing. Um, the, the overall kind of space you can see, Drew's probably familiar with that little chamber in there, uh, located in City Hall, the black box that is council chambers. Um, then we kind of have, you know, that original map that I'd shown of the confluence of the two rivers, and this is the piece that kind of celebrates that. The city that is being sort of, I guess, either introduced to that area or uplifted from that area, and I'll let you kind of decide. Um, during the install, when we first started, the seagulls were <laughs> crazy. I don't know if any of you have been down along the Bow River now in the past few years, that the amount of migrating sea like seabirds, mostly seagulls, uh, it's phenomenal. The sound is amazing. Um, but a very introduced species to this place. So it kind of speaks a lot to, I think, what Calgary is and what's here now. Um, the coyote sort of there looking out cautiously. Um, that piece then wraps around to form what we kind of just came to call the goddess. Uh, she's sort of riding her bike integrated with uh, coyote hands. You can see sort of, again, those sculptural components that are actually forming uh, a buffalo skull, which the whole sort of thing was founded on is kind of the backbone of that animal that was so giving to our ability to live here. Um, and I think that the bike is kind of worth celebrating, too, as like a new form of transport. It's kind of the new horse for us cowboys, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, here are some of the sculptural pieces. Obviously, you can see the scale of those. Those ended up becoming these sort of transportable pieces that the CMLC could use for, East, uh, for different sorts of uh, celebrations and that kind of thing. The airplane piece is a permanent piece, but we can take it away if needed. You know. um, <laughs> They were originally going to be concrete formed, like stay in place structures, but man, we overestimated uh, timeline and budget on that one. So <laughs> um, during installation, we, we had help from people from the drop in center. We had amazing support from people in that community. And then obviously the flood happened, and that kind of put a wrench in our spokes for a little bit. This was actually sn uh, sneaking down to these village. It was totally cut off at that point and getting photographs and kind of making sure that we uh, that still had work to come back to. <laughs> um, 
our insurance was going to run out the day after this photo was taken. So, <laughs> um, and that's kind of, yeah, the, the last piece that then I'll show, and that was a sort of celebration at the end of the, the making of it. So this is just to end it off, and thank you for your time. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I can tell you that your three bolts are still holding the sculptures in place. They are secure. Um, so uh, next, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Michelle DeBron, and to invite him to the stage, please welcome Councillor Drew Farrell. Are you inspired yet? I certainly am. Michel is a world-renowned Canadian artist living and working in Montreal. He obtained his Bachelor of Fine Arts at Concordia University and his Master's in Fine Arts from the Université de Québec et Montréal. Michel's expansive body of work ranges from assemblage to video and photography. Most of his works feature retooled everyday appliances transforming mundane objects with unexpected relationships between waste, productivity, risk, and consumption. Michel has been awarded the prestigious Sobe Art Award in 2007. He successfully completed numerous public artworks and commissions around the world in the last decade. In 2013, CMLC selected Michel following a rigorous RFP process to create a signature permanent piece that would define the identity of the new revitalized St. Patrick's Island and create a memorial, memorable interaction for island visitors and park users. That will be opening this summer, right, Susan? August? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Michel's installation called Bloom will be unveiled on St. Patrick's Island later this summer when the park reopens to the public following three years of careful restoration and rehabilitation. The bloom is inspired by the encounter between the natural landscape of the island park and Calgary's urban cityscape. And I'm very excited to watch the installation of Patrick's work and more excited to watch park goers respond to the installation. And so please join me in welcoming Michel de Bron. Enjoy, uh, and I was thinking maybe the next uh, project I'll try to do it in the mosaic. It's really, <laughs> wow, it's very beautiful. Um, I was, um, I'm not used to speak to such a big audience, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I was thinking of um, beginning with a uh, few uh, earlier work, just to put uh, this piece in a context. Um, I don't know where, how this works. Is, is it just like this? Ah, yes, okay, good, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I'm presenting you a few pieces that I made uh, earlier, like this piece uh, uh, was built in Montreal in 2003, 2003, yes. And um, it was um, dealing with uh, something that is part of the identity of Montreal, the staircase that are outside the houses. Um, this, yeah, like Montreal is very known for this. It's, a, it's part of this, uh, like the landscape to see like the stairs going to the second floor and they are curved like this. And uh, I like to take an element like stairs and try to make it like formally speak against what it is as a, as a, a symbol. So normally stairs here like are like, a, like gives you like this possibility to uh, to go up or down. It, it it brings this idea of progression, but here I twist the stairs into a node, so it creates um, a kind of infinite uh, like uh, circulation that deconstruct this idea of progress that you you have with the stairs. So it brings like I, I was thinking it like like how can I give uh, a form that will deconstruct the symbol that I'm using. I, and I'm quite happy with uh, how it turns out. But uh, I was uh, limited when I made it. Uh, the piece could not be accessible to the public because it was uh, on 
um, a, a situation like this. Uh, so uh, later, I, I made this uh, different version in, in France, where you could uh, actually walk and get lost into uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, experience, where you don't know exactly where it begins and where it ends. And at, 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 like, uh, when you're at, in the middle, you don't know if like where to go, uh, you get kind of lost inside of the uh, of the of this uh, this experience of uh, space and time. This was installed in a in a in a uh, in a monastery in uh, in France. Uh, here you can see inside. Um, or another piece here. It's uh, it's made with uh, with chairs, uh, conference chairs that are all uh, attached by their legs. Um, the legs are pointing out. It works a little bit like an immune system, a bit like if the conference room was protecting itself against the outside. And, uh, and yeah, and each component is like so in solidarity with the other. Like if you remove one chair, it will all collapse. So there's a kind of uh, a totality that is completed. And um, yeah, from, I think you can, ah. I, I was thinking we'll see the inside, but uh, yeah, the inside is uh, is inaccessible, but still you can imagine yourself in a kind of spaceship. Um, here is a piece I made in Montreal. Uh, it's um, it's a, a tree that is hiding uh, in the in the ground. It's like if the present of the tree was connecting with its past, and it creates a loop like this and. Uh, it's, uh, it was a very strange commission. I was commissioned to do a monument uh, to uh, Salvador Allende, the Chilean uh, president that was uh, uh, killed during the coup d'etat uh, in, uh, in Chile uh, when Pinochet took over uh, the dictatorship. And uh, no, I mean, when the Pinochet, the dictator, took over the democracy of uh, of, um, of uh, yeah, of Chile. So uh, yeah, it was an interesting uh, challenge to make a piece that uh, represents the, the the tension, the difficult, like the problem that was uh, there, but uh, but uh, but give a, a, a reading that was an universal in a way, um, like um, yeah. So here, a piece uh, I did for um, Nuit Blanche in Paris. Um, I was invited there, and I, had, I, I found the, the opportunity to propose a project that was totally uh, unbelievable. And I was not thinking that they will ever be able to commission this. But when I proposed it to the, the curator, they, they said, why not? And they went. Uh, they, 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 they find a way to make this piece. So this consists on a disco ball, but that is a, it's 7.5 meter in diameter. So it's like the like it was the, the idea was to make the biggest disco ball ever, <laughs> and um, it was um, there was like s five projector like a sky projector. It was hanging uh, 100 feet from the ground. And you could see it from everywhere in Paris. And it was transforming this park. Uh, le, 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 it was transforming this park that is normally um, uh, not uh, uh, accessible during, um, uh, the, like at night, because there's no light. It's totally dark. Uh, it's the Jardin du Luxembourg in Paris. And, it creates such a, ah, but I think I put, ah, yeah, here's a video that show. You don't see the scale of the, the piece uh, in the video, but you can see the effect of the light on the, that was quite amazing, and like, uh, It was a silent, um, a silent piece, and it wasn't installed only for two days. Like uh, one, it was a one-day event, but it was installed a day before for the test. Yeah, but a huge production.
Uh, yeah, this gives you a, an idea of the scale. <laughs> okay, so now I was thinking I will go in my slides and find like older pieces that I made with street lights because the piece I'm proposing like that you will see is uh, made with street lights. So this is uh, made in 99. It's my first public artwork. It's, uh, it's uh, during the transportation of the sculpture. I find it funny to have this piece uh, on a trailer because since uh, this uh, kind of super arrow is carrying a street light, uh, makes sense to be like uh, on the street. And um, um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's going to be installed in a public school. So the idea was to uh, bring back the light in the school. You know? And uh, yeah, it's like the kids really uh, relate with the, this culture. It was funny. This is a project I didn't do, but uh, it was in Ghent uh, in Belgium. I uh, proposed to do it. Uh, different scale, you know, it's an invitation f by the gallery here, uh, for wit. Uh, and uh, there was a crane installed when I visit first the gallery and uh, to participate in the Biennale. Uh, the crate was installed there, so I proposed them, look, my project, very simple. We're gonna cut down all the street light on the street and attach them together and hang them <laughs> from the crane. And uh, every night, uh, the guy, when they go, when they stop using the crane, they will lift the, the, the chandelier. And uh, yeah, everyone agree it's really simple, it's not difficult, but the problem is, when it, the time came to make the show, the crane was dismantled. <laughs> and we, we could not rent a crane. Those cranes are super expensive. Um, this piece was made in uh, New Orleans uh, for the Biennale there, during the Biennale. And it's made with, uh, with street lights that were uprooted uh, during uh, Katrina hurricane and that I could collect uh, for very cheap. And uh, I built this center core and uh, placed them uh, uh, together. Uh, like this, um, and install it on the, um, on the street for two years in, uh, in uh, New Orleans before it ended up at the National Gallery here for a permanent installation. But what, like this piece was made really much with, uh, with like the people uh, I met during my time there and, and uh, people that are, you know, welding a little bit. So it was, it was a bit, run down the way it was made, but it, it ended up to work very well and to sustain the wind and the, the clim climate in, uh, in New Orleans for two years. So uh, then uh, when it was purchased by the National Gallery, they checked it with an engineer and they said, oh yeah, it's okay. But uh, it's, it's great to make a piece before having it uh, controlled by the engineer. Because the, the piece I'm presenting is really much uh, uh, in continuity with this work. Uh, it's uh, uh, here, I, I, like it's, an, it's not my work, it's a work from Calder that is uh, installed in Montreal. And I just wanted to show uh, how uh, great is this work in Montreal. It's on Lille Saint Hélène. It was installed during um, Expo 67. Uh, the big uh, universal exhibition that was in Montreal. And it's, it's remaining, and it's one of the best sculpture I think we have. Uh, it's, uh, it's, what I, I liked about it is the way it is grown with only point like this. Uh, so it free all the space around, and it became uh, a, a place where um, there's a, what is called the picnic electronic, it's a, a music event every summer, and it's, it's amazing to see like a sculpture uh, invaded by people and appropriate like this. And I think I was quite inspired by this work when I, I proposed my piece for, um, for, um, for, for uh, Calgary. So uh, here uh, I was looking at the site and I was thinking, yes, I, I would like to have a piece that that uh, irradiate the city and open different uh, paths, uh, and that is very central. It's where the river joins, and it's like 
so I, 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 I developed this, this project, and I think we could show the model now, in fact. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, um, ah, yeah, you have it here, in fact. And we can turn it on. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So here you have to to imagine that that gets quite huge, right? 24 meter. So a, a person is about that big. So there, yeah. So you will be able to see the piece from the city, from far away. Like it will be, I think, attracting and like. Signaling the, the the island and the the, the 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 side, but at the same time, it's projecting light and direction like a compass everywhere. So it, it has this attraction and this kind of uh, extension uh, in the space. And uh, so I can imagine it could become a kind of center point in the on the island, a place where to meet and to do picnics. Um, and yeah, so here I was showing, the, I didn't know we were, we were gonna have the model, so I'm showing the model. It's funny to see the model in the studio. I put the plants around to, <laughs> to give like a, an effect of uh, like if we were on the, in the nature, and I think it works very well, <laughs> no? Uh, you, oops, I'm going too fast. Um, I don't know where to point. Okay, sorry. So here you see the, 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 the piece integrated on the site, uh, like, uh, and also on the new uh, landscape design of the, of the um, island that um, will be uh, inaugurated in August. And uh, yeah, it gives an idea of the... the... Oh, what is happening? <laughs> well, I think... You know what, I think the battery is like at the end of its life and it will be blinking, but it's, it's, it's not supposed to, it's the, the battery. Wow. But I, I don't, no, I don't like it. So I, I will turn it off. Or unless we find a plug. Okay, I can, no, we don't. Okay. Now this, this the battery is dead. Sorry about that. It's, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's maybe. But I don't know. We don't. We not. We will not have the light blinking. No. So another view here. But actually, the piece is not exactly. It should be just a little bit. Like I will say, maybe 50 meter back. But gives an idea. Okay. So air. When you make something like this, you. Like, uh, of course, this, this was a model I did, like uh, having a certain idea of how street light looks, taking pictures and thinking, okay, I want to have like something f like free. I don't want this light to refer to something specific, but to an idea of a light. And I want to make an arrangement. And uh, choosing light is a bit like choosing flowers at, uh, in, a, in a flower shop. So, but at the same time, it's, they are not so accessible. You have to, you have to they are custom made. And uh, so you have to, to search and find. And, and the, these are finally the, the lights that uh, I, I will be using that are quite similar, uh, most of them. Uh, there's maybe uh, this, like there is this one here. I have this, like this one here, that's, that's a different, uh, that will replace this one here. You see, but because this one doesn't exist, in fact. I, I, I invented it, but so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fun, like uh, creating street lights and trying to find like different components and place them together until you get like a, a design. Uh, so there's a lot of design, and this is like here. I've been working with a, uh, with a, an industrial designer uh, for the detail uh, because uh, yeah, it's uh, it needs to be like every aspect needed to be uh, engineered. And here it shows like um, what is above ground. It's about a quarter of the budget. In fact, in the in the sculpture is like what is above ground. We made the, a really safe. Uh, um, base that is anchor super deep 
uh, like I don't remember how much, but I think it's like 12 meter. Like the and there's like one, two, three, four. I think like almost uh, seven anchor, uh, 12 meter uh, underground. It's uh, so we're sh safe. I, it will not go away. <laughs> it will stay in Calgary. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, this is like the center core. It's really like a, a complicated geometry. Um, it looks like coming from outer space, and um, it's the, the design came from trying to imagine the concrete base that are underground and uh, that we don't see normally, or sometimes you can see them. On, it depends of uh, what kind of lights you have, but uh, to place them together and and uh, create a kind of like a, kind of a spaceship or something. And uh, here is the, all the different uh, fixture. And here, here you have like the different parts. And you can see uh, the, the, what is interesting here, the pink stuff is a spray you put on the weld uh, before you go to have them scan with a scanner because it's, it's on a, in a public uh, site and you don't want the things to fall. And the, so uh, the engineer asked to have each weld scanned by a, a kind of special scanner. And the, the, the pink paint is like a, something that, I don't know, ac is active with the scanner. And so you, you just to control each weld that are made by a, a specialized like, company that uh, build these kind of things. Uh, very simple design. There's like three plates of steel uh, that are uh, triangulating the legs. So it kind of like structure the, the, the ensemble. In fact, it's very, very simple. Compared to the, the other piece I made uh, in um, New Orleans, where it, uh, there was a lot of pieces of metal hidden inside. But here it's like very simple design. And it, I think it works well. And here we're starting to put these together. So it gives you an idea of the scale. And this is Mike. Uh, Mike is uh, my fabricator, the contractor. He's like, doing a really good job on this. Uh, yeah, here is another view. Yeah, and here you have it together. Uh, adding from adding from uh, from the crane, and here with the legs, and this is a, a first test um, at the shop. So the piece is not painted yet, and we we're gonna just install the three legs. It gives an idea. Ah, okay, and this is a, a, a stop motion. Animation gives you an idea of the scale. That's it for now. <laughs> OK, thank you. That concludes our individual presentations for the evening. So please join me in a round of applause for all the artists. We are going to move into the question and answer segment for the evening. Um, we're really, it's your opportunity to take the lead and ask those questions to the artists and about the installations that are in East Village or coming to East Village, um, just about what those placemaking efforts look like. To moderate this segment, we've asked Yves Trepanier to help us out. And for those of you who don't know Yves, he's the partner in Trepanier Bear Gallery on 10th Avenue and 8th Street.
Um, the gallery specializes in the exhibition and sale of Canadian and international contemporary art and is considered to be one of Canada's leading commercial contemporary art galleries. In addition, uh, sorry, in addition to representing well-known mid-career and senior artists, the gallery maintains an active and successful program for the presentation of younger emerging Canadian artists. And since its founding in 1992, the gallery has launched many careers and staged first exhibition of works by many now critically acclaimed artists. Eves is an advocate for and supporter of public art. In 2012, he founded Art to Public, a private consultancy specializing in services in the areas of public art. And through Chapanier Bear, and now, pub, now Art to Public, they have managed major public art projects and commissions for private collectors, corporations, and civic entities for over 23 years. He has a strong sense of community service and has been involved with numerous philanthropic activities specific to the visual arts. He now sits on the board of Contemporary Calgary, whose mandate is to establish a new contemporary public art gallery in the Centennial Planetarium. Also joining Eves is CMLC Senior Manager of Development, Neil McKimmy. In his role, Neil leads the Riverwalk Development Project and the rejuvenation of St. Patrick's Island. He has first-hand knowledge of the trials and tribulations of executing complex infrastructure projects, which are planned to include public art. Please um, join me in welcoming Eves Trepanier, Neil McKimmy, and the artists to the stage. I feel so far from you guys now. Okay, great. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, CMLC, for creating these amazing opportunities and also to the artists for rise, rising to the occasion. It's fantastic. <clears throat> Before I uh, open questions up to uh, the audience, I'd like to ask Neil McKinney, McKimmy, who is uh, new to the panel, and we can get his tongue loosened up a little bit. So I'll, uh, and I know you like to talk, Neil. Right, right. So uh, um, I'd like to ask a question about um, locations and citing art, because we all know that citing a public work of art uh, is time consuming, it can sometimes be difficult. Um, we're working on a project right now uh, where the first three meetings with the client were only about siting. So we'd be interested in knowing how CMLC comes to those uh, sorts of decisions uh, in the East Village. Sure. Um, I guess I'd just like to say, first of all, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, if I seem a little bit nervous, both my mother and my mother-in-law are in the audience tonight. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to act uh, probably a bit cooler than I am. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, I think um, it was alluded to earlier by Susan and uh, by Ron. Um, where we really start with these things is the foundation or vision documents that were given to us to implement um, as CMLC. And those include uh, the East Village uh, Area Redevelopment Plan and the East Village Master Plan and the Center City Plan and a whole pile of others. And those documents specifically call out the need and the desire for public art. But they not only do that, as Ron said, the East Village Area Redevelopment Plan specifically calls out that public art should be considered at the same time as the infrastructure is going in. So for us, um, public art essentially becomes uh, part of uh, the infrastructure. It's an infrastructure challenge. So uh, taking that premise, uh, when we start a new project, whether it be an improvement to a streetscape, um, uh, building an underpass, uh, doing an, an open space like Riverwalk or, um, or St. Patrick's Island. Right from the word go, we're really trying to think how public art can be incorporated in, in the projects. And so then you kind of assess where those opportunities are and, and what you're trying to achieve. And in each one of these, we really did sort of have some, some base desires. Um, Julian Opie's piece, for instance, is intended to really be an iconic marker that would become synonymous with East Village. So when you saw that piece, you would know you were in East Village and, and it could be, you know, meet you down at the, at the Walking Man sculpture. Um, Ron's piece and Daniel's pieces, of course, are, um, uh, among other things, are really intended to provide visual screening for 
uh, what are really large-scale, very urban pieces of infrastructure that were pretty harsh. Um, we built Riverwalk underneath the overpasses and recognized right away that when you go under the overpasses, it's a pretty nasty situation. And so we wanted to try to figure out how we could actually soften that experience and bring that uh, uh, experience back to the pedestrians so that they could enjoy it. Um, Michelle's piece, you know, really, as he said, is, is really that thought of kind of being a beacon to the island, you know, uh, bringing people back to the island and drawing people into the island. So citing definitely is important, but it sort of comes from those base documents and then, and then what the actual opportunity is. Um, I had the, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick for a second. I had the privilege of sitting on the jury that uh, chose Patrick's piece for the National Music Center, and uh, there had been um, a number of pre-designated sites that were um, given to the artists, and, but Patrick actually surprised everybody and chose a site that was not part of the, or part of the, 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 the designated site. So could you talk a little bit about that and perhaps the yeah. process that you went through? Um, yeah. Because it's a little bit different. Yeah, it was a little different. Um, just because it's in my head too, I want to kind of talk a little bit about what you mentioned about from the beginning picking sites and with the NMC um, being able to enter the project before it was even built. And the way you can approach it is, it, it is going to be a cumulative experience, a collective experience that um, with public art, it's, uh, it's a huge responsibility for the artists and those choosing sites. And a lot of times in the world we live in, you know, you think of the immediate, ah, it's installed, you open it, it's great, and then it's all done. But really it, it seasons and it, it changes our entire um, sense of that place and the experience we have with a community over 20, 30 years, um, even if it's five years. It's still this prolonged experience and I like to think about that when I approach any site or any project. And um, yeah, with the NMC, I, I was really interested in, that, in the sky bridge for a few reasons. One, because it's this link between the two buildings, but also it was one of the places where there's not activity going on or there's not a, um, an exhibit or uh, it's really, uh, it's this hallway of, uh, I just envisioned if I was a visitor going through the entire National Music Center, all the different exhibits and enjoying that and then taking a moment to step aside, find a, a space that isn't necessarily music, it's a sound composition, but it's a drone, it's a uh, isolated note. Um, in some ways it counters or balances the experience of the viewer to then go to the sky bridge and experience this, and then to also link the visual component of these, these vessels uh, constructed from the soundboards from what was part of the collection and to read into that information and, and the craftsmanship that will be behind that. And, um, I just saw it as a really great opportunity to, uh, to use that space and somehow highlight the art. Great, thank you. One more question for Neil, and this comes up often. Um, does CMLC have a, a preference in where artists are from, uh, Canadian, national, regional, or international artists? Is, is that, how, do, how do you solve or answer that question, and how do you come to those decisions? Uh, no, the short answer is no, we don't, we don't really have a preference or a bias. Um, I think what we have thought in the end is important is that um, the right artist is selected for the right opportunity to ensure that you're going to have a successful project at the end of the day. Um, so for some of our projects that we've done that have been uh, larger scale and more complex, um, we've cast that net a little bit farther to try to make sure that at the end of the day, we end up with somebody that um, has experience and is capable of actually executing the project and succeeding at the project at the scope and scale and complexity that, that we desire. Um, so we do have, we have uh, Julian Opie from a uh, famous pop artist from, from the UK. Um, but uh, through our project, we've, we've definitely tried to make sure that we tie back, uh, tie back to our local community, um, the project. Uh, that Daniel's on was, was a call that we did to the local community and, and we've really been lucky at the end of the day. Um, we were one of the early adopters of the city's uh, wrapping the transit box um, uh, project that they've done that's been hugely successful and is now throughout the entire city. 
And so we really have sort of um, uh, that entire uh, continuum from, uh, from the young, just starting out artists who are entirely local all the way through to, uh, to international artists. Um, so really it's more a matter of matching the artist to the, uh, to the opportunity than it is sort of picking and choosing where they're from. Great, thank you. Okay, let's open it up to the audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the artist or for Neil? Surely there must be a question. There we go, ma'am, please. Thank you. It was very interesting to hear the various concepts, concepts that went into the artworks. Um, my question is, I don't know whether Neil or Michelle should answer it, but I'm wondering why, or maybe the effect of having a light sculpture in what is a quasi-natural area. Um, the Bow River, the river sides of the island itself. Um, I think about the efforts to reduce light pollution for birds, and I know this isn't pollution, but it, does a bird know the difference? Uh, is it working? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a good question, and I was uh, I was concerned about this. Of course, uh, that, that I was thinking someone will ask this question because, uh, of course, it's uh, obvious. But um, in this case, uh, it's because you're thinking of street lights, and it's it's not exactly uh, what we will get. The the the, the light I'm using will be ver dim at the minimum. Just. So to reveal the light, but not to create, uh, you know, a kind of illumination that could not be really nice to have if it was blinding people in any way in the park. So it's more like um, a kind of decorative light. It's not really like uh, an intense light, and uh, also um, it 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 help like it will give a little bit of light on the, you know, there's a few street lights on the, on the park also. It was in the, the um, it was in fact, uh, how you say cahier charge, like in the list of, of, uh, of uh, things that were uh, describing the project also the, in the, on, the, um, on the island, there was a need for a few lights just so people can find their way and uh, but I think it's important to not add, to to not make too much light, to, to not disturb the the phone, and um, I'm really uh, aware of that. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, I could add a couple really brief comments. One of the things that we did when we we put out the call for the project, the St. Patrick's Island project, um, we ended up having the shortlisted artists all come in and spend pretty extensive time on the island to actually understand it. And uh, then we, back at the office, had a long meeting to go over the um, St. Patrick's Island master plan that was a year-long uh, process in the making and had thousands of touches with the uh, members of the community in Calgary. And so we wanted to try to make sure that the art project was sort of based in uh, the, the, all that hard work and public engagement that happened um, for uh, for the island master plan. So within that master plan, there was the whole con, uh, concept of biophilic design, meaning trying to actually design within the context of nature. And um, when you say it that way, it sounds like what you're really talking about is just green uh, type design thought, but biophilic design can be uh, beyond that. It's sort of, you know, how you can figure out how to mimic um, nature within uh, other somewhat context and I think Michelle's piece did that beautifully like at the end of the day it's we thought or the way that we saw it when we were discussing it through the selection process um, it's a really organic piece you know bloom right I mean it's it's got this the the aspect of it being indeed like a flower um, but it uses these very urban uh, materials to try to have that expression so for us, where the you know the island at the end of the day is intended to be an urban oasis, and um, it was a really nice sort of bringing together of the urban with the natural that somewhat defines the entire larger project. Thanks. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes, please. 
there's a mic coming your way. I had a question for um, perhaps Ron and Daniel. I was curious about what is the maintenance plan or kind of the wear and tear on your project, specifically for the mosaic? Um, how, did, how is that kind of maintained or um, how do you work with your fabricators to ensure that you can? Yeah, there's a, um, well, of course, it's an ancient technique. I mean, it goes way, way back. It's relatively bulletproof. Uh, it's been up for several years, and there's no um, damage or graffiti or anything, which I think speaks well to most people's appreciation of the work and the sighting of it. Um, but uh, one of the amusing things that happened, I, I spoke of the people that visited the site when we installed it. Another thing that happened was the, the idea, what if? You know, because there's building going on, what happens if a truck accidentally does something. So um, Neil managed to find a local uh, tile company and brought them into the site uh, with the view to, if there were damage done of that kind, um, who could be brought in to do the repairs, I mean, given the right materials, et cetera, et cetera. And what was really quite wonderful was that um, the two craftspeople who came to the site both spoke German. And it was like, boom. <laughs> Any problem? Give us a call. We're done. So that was totally, totally brilliant. But that's also a simple answer is, to, is there is a manual, and it will be cleaned occasionally. And it won't be one of the trucks that cleans out the bus shelters. <laughs> and I think uh, just for our work, it, it's, it's temporary in nature. That uh, Riverwalk kind of gallery space is, uh, we were originally just contracted for two years. It's extending, I think, by one year um, because the piece is wearing well and it's also, I think, maintaining popularity or uh, with the construction plan that the CMLC has. Maybe Neil can speak more about that. but. Um, that will be replaced by another artist's work uh, in the next year or so, I think. So um, our goal was to kind of hit a real good two years, everything looks great, and then let it kind of go from there. So um, graffiti and the idea of like graffiti abatement was always sort of an issue. Really, it's going to be an issue all the time with two-dimensional work and kind of the nature of what I do as a mural artist. Uh, Generally, you just do what you can to kind of, you know, engage local community during the process of the research as well as the art making. Um, and we kind of had people actually paint within certain confines of the, uh, like the train itself, for example. On one of the abutments, there was already uh, tagging going on on the trains, but no one notices because it <laughs> looks like the trains are tagged as they are. So that was kind of a nice way to get some graffiti artists in the city to actually have their input into the process, which we just sort of kept that uh, quiet. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, you might be interested in knowing is when an artist submits a proposal, one of the requirements of that proposal is that they provide a maintenance uh, manual with procedures. So all of these projects would have had, well, perhaps not. Uh, Our major uh, issue will be uh, how does it all come down? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we made but they are required work. to submit uh, a maintenance procedure. Yes? Removal of three screws. Yeah. Did I see a hand somewhere over there? I was wondering if uh, the, the development project for this, uh, if it kind of generated new ideas both in the, the selection process and the creation project process, and if there is kind of new opportunities um, that has come out of this that are now on the horizon for future development. I think that's a question for Neil, probably. Um, sure. So. Um uh, like Daniel alluded, our, our initial thought with the uh, Riverwalk abutments and the washrooms was that they be a curated uh, area. And so the plan was that we would do 24 months uh, and then um, uh, change out the artists and bring in somebody new. Uh, Daniel's 
uh, work actually replaced uh, work that was done by Derek Besant that was there for two years prior. Um, as Daniel said, it, we just have, have had fantastic reception on his piece, and I think um, for that reason you, we, we've kept it uh, for an additional year. Um, we do have that project coming up again, probably within a year. Um, we also, in the pipe right now, have uh, public art uh, coming up for the new central library. Um, that one is going to be subject to a, a future placemakers uh, discussion, so I won't get into it too much now. But I, I think we definitely, um, one thing we've for certain found out is people behind, you know, the, the group tasked with doing the public infrastructure work that would encourage private investment to come down is opportunities for public art are, are all over the place. and so. Um, we have people come to us with ideas. Uh, we have new projects coming on where we try to think about it within that context. And uh, it's, not, it's not so formal yet, which is a great thing about CMLC organizationally is still relatively small and we're able to, to be quick and nimble with our decisions. So um, uh, all I can guarantee is there will be more. I can't tell you exactly how or when that process is gonna happen. Perhaps I could just <laughs> chime in. I really want to do another mosaic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I kind of want to go to Munich again. So. Well, okay. okay, we're good. So I'm hearing rumors about West Village, so can you guys sort of do that? <laughs> and we'll do a sort of a bookend thing? Because I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> oh, one little uh, interest, I found it interesting anyway. I came here in 1957 as a 12-year-old, and what I found out in doing this project is that the Meyer of Munich people um, did the stained glass windows in St. Mary's Cathedral in that very same year, 1957. Which is a, a, a structure that was designed by Max Bates, the great Calgary painter and architect designed that church and commissioned Mayor of Munich to do the stained uh, glass windows. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, something I've noticed pretty much every artist has touched on one way or another is the engagement of community to make these works, whether it's through the history or the research for the project or the actual implementation of the project. Um, and with placemakers being a place for making people to live, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about the importance of that community engagement. Well, it's a tricky one when you put things out into the public sphere because um, most artists will have a, normal experiences dealing with institutions and galleries and that kind of a network. And there is implicit in people going to galleries um, a sort of an, a, a tacit agreement that you will be, if not challenged, you will discover things that are strange and different. And, but that's not the case when you put it on the street. So it is important to find that engagement in, I think, different ways, uh, given the different circumstances of the, of the, uh, of the projects. And I, I think um, the issue around citing is a really, really important thing. Because sometimes you, you can, stand, and I'm not just talking about Calgary here, you can see things that are really quite splendid, but they're in like a stupid place. <laughs> and if I can, be forgiven for suggesting. One of the, one of the things I've noticed um, locally is that we have the Percent for Art program, which generally I think is a good idea and uh, gets things done which wouldn't normally happen. Um, but there is a sort of a budget ownership around these kinds of things. And so what you can find is you've got um, a project um, that has a percent for art understanding about it, but it's really not the best place for sticking a piece of art. It, you're, you're better off to have um, uh, 
a little better design in the infrastructure or something like that. What I would like to see, if I may, is some pooling of those budgets so that um, perhaps something a little grander could be then cited in a more, in a better place. <laughs> Does that help answer the question a little? I, I want to, just because it reminded me, I kind of did forget to mention it, an entire component of the solar drones is that because there's this pool of resident artists and musicians that create work at the National Music Center, each of those will have the opportunity, if they're interested, to tune this piece and create a composition which is really pretty challenging over you know, a 10 to 14 hour period, depending on the time of year, to think of a composition over that period of time. You know, a lot of them probably won't have any interest in doing that, but um, I'm hoping that some of them will, will do so and will play with the sun that way in the sky. Michelle, I think uh, you mentioned the kind of space underneath your sculpture. Kind of gathering space. Do you want to yes, talk a little bit about that? Yes, but at the same time, yeah, to the question. But it's a it's a question uh, that uh, I had today, um, and um, the, for I think that's I, I understand totally uh, the concern an artist could have for its community. I think it's really uh, it could be really meaningful, and it could make really good project also if you're really aware of your of the community. But I think also that art, at some point, in some, in, in some case, uh, a sculpture could come from outer space and destabilize people and destabilize the community. And uh, and I I don't think art necessarily. Uh, should um, like fulfill uh, the expectation of, of uh, the community or, or of the public. Sometimes art could like uh, be uh, like uh, just challenging, um, and um, and it can. Sometimes it takes time uh, to uh, for the community to um, to uh, also to accept this this new. Uh, object, uh, you know, there's a, this, uh, I think, and it's important to understand how, like in good art, sometimes there's a lot of alterity of, there's something other, there's another nest that, that doesn't necessarily make sense uh, to the community right away. It, it sometimes it takes time, mm -hmm. and the piece needs to be adapted, and, and, uh, and it can be complicated, but it's like uh, it's something uh, that changed uh, the landscape, that changed the way we experience the, the city, and it could uh, be disturbing also. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. That's, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I mean. <laughs> My question is in regards to the short term that the art is up. I'm actually quite shocked when you consider all the man hours, the committee hours, the design, preliminary designs, this, and then to know that it comes down in a short term of two years, I'm just wondering why the reasoning for that. I know other artists have a time, you know, giving other artists an opportunity to express themselves, but I think, wow, what a beautiful piece of art, and then you think, oh, it's coming down in two years. And it just, I don't understand the reasoning for that, why we can't. Sure. What is, why the short term? I could take a stab at that. Um, I mean, the main reason is, is that's what was put out in the call to start. Um, we, we thought when, you know, we, um, when we identify the opportunities that we're looking at really early on, we talked about this notion of the iconic piece. We talked about some of the visual screening for some of the um, uh, larger scale pieces of infrastructure. We also really thought about this notion of having curation involved and things that could rotate in and rotate out and that would allow for other people to be involved. And so, um, yeah, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree with you more that the, the piece that Daniel and his colleagues did, um, it's amazing. Uh, and it's not, gonna be, it's not gonna be easy when we, we have to go out there and figure out that something else is gonna, is gonna come along. But, from the word go, that was the task that Daniel and his group set out to do. It was listed as the, 
the criteria within the call was, you know, we're looking for something that's going to be here for two years that could um, uh, sort of tick off all these boxes that we're looking for. And then we sit down and we assess uh, those uh, submissions and we make the best choice. And, uh, uh, you know, certainly that was Daniel's. And we'll go through that uh, process again um, relatively shortly here and hope that we come back with something that's going to be just as appealing. I could speak just a little bit too then to that as from the artist's perspective on this. Um, I, I guess because it's temporary, it does free something up. Um, we don't have to spend as much money on the actual kind of engineering or something for a permanent piece. The maintenance manual becomes much simpler to write. Um, and realistically, I think we were grilled more on the removal than the actual um, <laughs> maintenance of the work a little bit because of that. But, uh, but it freed us up for more of the process. And the process is what I think myself and my colleagues were mostly interested in. So we spent almost two months installing that work, which for paintings uh, gives us a chance to be right at the ground level under bridge abutments in the East Village before any of the condo units or anything else is built, we got a chance to really like survey the existing community that was there, have a chance to talk to people, and actually employ um, two people from the DI who came out and helped us every day. So we tried to kind of channel some of that, um, that money into a more kind of local economy, local community. Um, and that, again, probably wouldn't happen if it were a more permanent piece, you kind of have to, I think, you know, engage more specialists and it just, you know, costs go up, timeline, you know, in 30, 40, 50 years, maybe depending on the work, it doesn't maybe weather so well either. So it kind of gets to be glorious for a few years and then someone else has an opportunity to. So. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, my, uh, my question is really prompted by the earlier uh, tangential discussion on creating a better place for citing public art. And uh, I was thinking better place from the perspective presumably of the viewer or the public, member of the public who is experiencing that art. But in our extremely polarized and economically polarized society, whose perspective will determine whether the citing of a piece of public art is in a better place or is in, in an indifferent place or in an inferior place? I mean, I was thinking, of, I, this is the question I suppose the counselor might consider later on. <laughs> I was thinking of the light, Michelle's light in a park, okay? And which will be seen from all over the, all over the city, presumably. Or, and uh, it might be a beacon for the homeless to come to the park at night, especially on a summer night. But chances are the park, park will be closed between the hours of 10 and 6 or something like that. <laughs> so I think there are certain ways in which we have to reconceptualize public art in our not just temporary uh, economy, but then this, this, this uh, dissolving capitalistic economy that is creating such chasms between uh, one member of society and another. That's all. Thank you. Do you, do you, have, a, do you have a suggestion? I don't have. I'm asking. You're the expert. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be sitting there otherwise. You make good observations. Does anybody want to take it on quickly? Um, <laughs> I, maybe we'll I mean, I was really it's, it's, briefly about I mean, I, I think the answer is that you do the best you can. Sure. And it's further to Michelle's comment, I mean, it's worth remembering that if you took a vote in Paris when about the Eiffel Tower, it never would have happened. Yeah. But try giving that away. <laughs> so you, you, uh, it's, there's no answer to it. It's, 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 um, and in Chicago with Anish Kapoor's uh, stainless steel cloud, Cloud. I mean, there would have been no support for for paying that kind of money for for that piece. But private um, philanthropy made it happen, and now 
bazillion people from all over the planet go to Chicago just to see that sculpture. We had a great example in Calgary that lasted only a couple days right after Occupy Calgary. There was uh, a piece that was installed that probably would have been commissioned for you know, five or six hundred thousand dollars, a beautiful stainless steel sculpture that ended up right in Olympic Plaza. Um, moved, I think, very quickly because it didn't go through a permission process. So again, in the public, it is hard to find a balance, I suppose, between something that is of the people or for the people, because that was sort of a piece that was of the people and for the people, but ultimately, too, there's no way to guarantee public safety within a piece that didn't go through the proper permissions and protocols as well. If it falls over and kills someone, even if it's of the people, for the people, it's still a difficult thing. Um, it's the, killing people. It's still, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, finding more public voice to support um, the, the process, in my opinion, is, is a, a better solution, allowing more trust in artists to connect um, the maybe the dots between those d large gaps, you know, like the, the socioeconomic gaps or cultural gaps or whatever it is, instead of maybe having to strictly adhere to a preconceived notion of what that is, really engaging in that process of creation. And I know, like Michelle had sort of said, allowing something to be from outer space might be a, a good way to start. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Hey, thank you, everyone. That concludes our first Placemakers speaker event. Uh, thank you again for everyone who attended, to the City of Calgary, our shareholder, for their guidance in East Village over the years, and most importantly, to this um, wonderful panel of artists who are part of East Village, and more importantly, Calgary. And I think the turnout tonight speaks to the importance of public art, and we're happy to see you all here. Um, our next event will be in the fall. If you're interested in following along for more information, you can follow us on, at East Village Calgary YYC or register on calgarymlc.ca. So please keep the conversation rolling using the hashtag EVPlacemakers. Um, thank you and good night.